Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. This time we are looking at something very special, very esoteric, uh, very expensive when new, very interesting. Uh, is, in fact, it's probably just about very everything really, apart from economical and sensible transport. Uh, it is the Iso Grifo. Um, and this was uh, the brainchild of uh, Giotto Bizzarini, who was a hugely pivotal character in uh, Italian uh, exotic and racing car engineering in the 1960s. He was working for Enzo Ferrari. He developed the 250 GTO uh, for Enzo Ferrari, and um, that is the most revered and valuable classic car on the planet, or one of them. And examples of the 250 GTO, to put that into context, can go for a hundred million dollars or even a little more. He, uh, he left Ferrari in the Palace Revolt, as it was called, of either 1961 or 62. Uh, he had a, a V12 racing engine on his books, which he designed, a three and a half litre engine, and uh, he didn't quite know what to do with it. And then a, a, some Italian entrepreneur called Ferruccio Lamborghini got in touch with him and he bought his engine design and the rest is history. Giotto Bizzarini, to say he was um, a high achiever is putting it, playing it low down very much indeed. He formed a company uh, called ESO um, and they came up with this car, which is the road going version of the ESO 5300 GT. Um, they're both front mid engined. Uh, racing car origins, so the front axle, obviously the center line is there. The engine is actually just behind the front axle. So it is a genuine front mid-engine car, which is quite unusual actually. And the reason for that is obviously it keeps the weight within the wheelbase, which makes the handling suitably excellent, basically, because you don't have weight overhangs. I suppose the opposite of that would be the Porsche 911, where um, a huge lump of engine is at the back comparative to the rest of the car. And uh, particularly the early 911s uh, were tail happy for that reason. So this is, um, a well-conceived car. Uh, it was very successful as the competition version, which is slightly lower and uh, a bit more swoopy, but a rare beast, this car. Uh, the Grifo was made in two versions. This is the very early version. In fact, this is the 47th car built out of 418 only in total. I don't know how many survive now. Uh, that's a very interesting question and I actually can't find a definitive answer, but Bearing in mind, nobody wanted these 30 years ago. They rusted like all Italian cars. So I think there's probably 50% left in existence, just over 200 around the whole world. Uh, so it's a very unusual car. Um, when it was new, the 1960, I've got my crib sheet here, which um, I need to refer to because uh, this car is steeped in history, this particular model actually. It's got all sorts of interesting styling features on it. I'll get to the crib sheet in a moment. It's got vents here, um, a vent there, uh, more vents down there, more vents there, and more on the rear wings. I think it's the most vented car ever built, possibly excluding a modern hypercar with wings and aerodynamic devices and everything, but I don't know how many vents it's got, but um, uh, Giorgetto Giaro obviously wanted to vent his frustration when he was styling it. Um, but anyway, it was Bertoni who built the bodies. Uh, this is the 47th car built, as I said, and the first 50 were actually built in the Bertone factory before the production was moved, production, <laughs> uh, was moved to, uh, to ESO. And there are various interesting things about lovely details on this car. Uh, obviously, this was around the same time as the Lamborghini Miura and we have all sorts of parts that are actually taken out of Bertone's parts bins and general parts bins of Italian cars of the period. And all this makes for interesting viewing because it, it shows, it, it helps to paint a picture of how very esoteric and um, low quantity build these cars were. They couldn't afford to make their own bits, so they pinched them off other cars. Um, these little door release buttons here, uh, as with the inside door release and the window switches and various other bits are all from the Fiat 850 Spider. Uh, very unusual car and um, 
The other car that used these bits was the Lamborghini Miura. So the door release handles are from the Miura. They use them right through on the Countach. Um, and even this styling device here of the front door sort of wrapping around part of the windscreen and then this cut down there, that is a carbon copy of uh, Marcello Gandini's Miura. It, just an achingly, stunningly beautiful car, this. It's the quintessential um, high-performance GT. Uh, the styling, beautiful, swoopy styling. Um, everything is just right. Everything is in proportion. Uh, it, until you get to the dashboard, which looks like it's out of an Austin Cambridge. Um, it's, a, it's just a wooden slab with holes drilled in it for the gauges and controls and things. So I, I think, um, unlike the Lamborghini Miura, which had an incredibly avant-garde and flamboyant dashboard for the time, um, they obviously didn't have time to style a dashboard or, uh, or blew the budget on the outside or whatever, I don't know. Um, maybe somebody went on holiday, one of uh, Jujaro's underlings, and uh, they suddenly thought, <gasps> we haven't got a dashboard. I have no idea, but it's, it's um, quite in, in uh, contrast to the outside of the car. And that was um, quite normal for cars, of, some cars, some exotic cars. The dashboard was the poor relation. But there isn't much about this car that is the poor relation. Uh, give you some idea. Uh, new, this car had a ticket price in 1969 of $14,000. And to put that into perspective, um, a Ferrari 275 GTB4 Nart Spider rolls off the tongue, that, obviously. Um, they made 10 of those for uh, Luigi Cinetti's North American racing team. Beautiful car. Again, a stunning looking car and they were very, very expensive when they were new, and they were $8,000. And now they change hands for around about, the Nart Spiders, when one of the 10 comes to market, you're talking 18 million pounds, something like that. Now, this car is, it's come in to be prepped for sale, and it ain't worth anything like that, but um, it is, just gives you an idea of context that this car was fearsomely expensive when it was new. Um, and I'm now going to uh, consult my notes um, because this car in particular has a very interesting history. It was ordered um, by the, the New Jersey dealer in the US for his wife's personal use, as you do. Um, and um, it was uh, it delivered in the US in 1967. Um, it was then sold to a, uh, another gentleman in the US. Um, and they, uh, it, it originally started life as a GL340, um, which means it's got the Corvette uh, 5.4 litre 327 cubic inch um, V8 engine, the small block Chevy. And it came in various states of tune. Um, we do have to be careful with horsepower figures in the 1960s because um, you have uh, such gray areas as SAE or DIN, net or gross, etc. It was, um, and not every car manufacturer was honest with the, uh, with the authorities on what they car, their, their engines were producing. Uh, the Americans tended to downplay the horsepower figures because the insurance companies um, would much rather insure a 19-year-old a guy um, in a 300-horsepower uh, car than they would in a 350-horsepower car. So for that reason, the manufacturers did tone it down. But the Italians, of course, like to, uh, to uh, increase it and round it up to a nice, round, suitably impressive figure. Um, this is the GL340, as it was called, which is um, 340 brake horsepower or thereabouts, for the reasons I've explained. Um, and what happened to this car, um, interestingly, was the, the second owner, the first, car, the first owner didn't use the car, uh, <laughs> what it is to have money to be able to do things like that, but um, he sold the car um, for $7,500 in 1969, still, still a king's ransom um, at the time. And uh, it got an, a few upgrades the, but the second owner wasn't quite happy with the performance of the car. And um, I'm just quoting from my little uh, 
points here. A few months later, over drinks one evening, um, uh, Shaw with Joel Rosen and motor industry friend Zora Arkos Duntov. Now, um, apart from sounding for all the world like the ultimate Bond villain, um, Zora Arkos Duntov was um, head of the high performance car division at General Motors, aka Corvette. And he has since become known as the father of the Corvette. The result of that meeting was that uh, Zora Arkos Duntov sent the owner of this car a crated brand new Corvette LT1 engine, which was their high performance small block Corvette engine at the time, which developed allegedly 370 brake horsepower. Um, now we don't know whether that's SAE or DIN because it's all very fudgy and uh, flaky at the time, but um, the National Hot Rod Association in the US actually rated it at 420, I think, or roundabout brake horsepower. So who's to say? Uh, I mean, that's pretty punchy. That's getting up to uh, uh, 60, 70 brake horsepower a litre off the top of my head. That's pretty punchy for um, a, a road civilised American V8 of the time. But anyway, big numbers. Net result is it's a fast car. Um, it was recorded in period as doing a uh, not to 60 mile an hour time of under six seconds, which is impressive. Uh, certainly very impressive and put it, put it in the supercar bracket in the 1960s. Uh, and it did the standing quarter mile in 14 seconds, um, a, a slightly detuned version of this car. So super, super, super car. Um, but isn't it just gorgeous? It really is. It's still got the LT1 engine in it. Um, the car was uh, restored by Barkerways down in Kent, who've done a lovely job. And like a lot of people in the classic car business, I actually do give credit where credit's due. Um, I'm not particularly uh, uh, diffident about um, recognizing good work. So um, they restored the car. It's come in for a few jobs. Uh, the, uh, there are one or two interesting things about the car, apart from the vents and things like that, which, um, are quite interesting. So um, we'll have a look at that. Uh, I'm gonna um, just have a look at the engine and then we'll take it out for a run and see if those ponies are alive and kicking. Well, of course, one of the delights of uh, Italian cars is the ergonomics and the tactileness of everything. Um, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But um, one of the examples of good is this beautiful ashtray, which was sort of standard fare in Ferraris and things of this era. Just a lovely thing. If you ever decide to buy an ESO Grifo um, and uh, you have it in your garage at two o'clock in the morning and you can't sleep, this is an amazing way of uh, just providing a little, a little peace is to actually move that back and forth because it's really lovely. Um, however, when you operate the handbrake, um, as one would, ow! There's no room between the button and the, uh, the window switch console here for your thumb, and it ends up getting trapped. Typical Italian 1960s ergonomics. Um, one of the other delights is the uh, horn pushes in the steering wheel, uh, the ammeter moves as the um, air horn compressor draws current when you press it. <coughs> Lovely. Um, guaranteed to, uh, to make any pizza fly higher in the air as you drive past. Um, and just all very nice, all part of the tactile experience of these cars. One of the quirks of this car, um, not, not uh, forgetting the, the Lamborghini Miura and Fiat 850 Spider door handles I mentioned earlier, is the, the, I mean, not many cars in the 1960s had electric windows. It was the very top 5% of cars only. Um, but this has got the two switches on the center console made by a French company called Ducellier, who made electrical equipment distributors, etc. But it's got this other switch, which is um, accessible from uh, outside the car or by reaching in or something. I don't quite understand 
but um, as you can see, the uh, electric window flies down. Um, but um, and it's got this lovely, lovely action. Beautiful. Um, these tend to wear. It's the same as is used on uh, Lamborghini Murras for the pop-up headlights, and also the windows on the S, uh, the early S's. And um, all the current goes through the switch, uh, which means that the contacts in the switch can wear and burn. The whole contact, the whole current for moving the window up and down goes through that. But that was Auto Electrics at the time. Um, certainly Italian Auto Electrics. Uh, you've got this beautiful opening quarter light, of course. Just the thing for when you're smoking your expensive cigarette uh, and flicking the ash out of the window, presumably not hitting the leather. Um, if you were, as a lot of people were, smokers in the 60s, but that's a lovely touch, just remote control quarter lights. Um, I mean, your life is complete when you have remote control quarter lights. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna have a look at the engine and then um, we'll, we'll take it out on the road. Well, here it is, uh, beautifully presented 5.4 litre, three, 327 Corvette engine. And uh, it can quite clearly be seen that the centre line, the front axle centre line is there. And all but the water pump and the alternator are aft of that for fantastic weight distribution. And it also lowers what's called the polar moment of inertia. Um, if the engine was there and you had all sorts of things sticking out the back, it would be like a bob weight effect, which I talked about on the Porsche 911 video again, where the, the weight is sort of dictating which way the car goes. But because it's in the middle, um, it makes for really fantastic handling. Uh, so um, I'm going to give the engine a tune up. This is one of the beauties of the uh, American engines when they buy a crated engine or when they bought a crated engine, whoever it was, uh, Jensen, um, Di Tommaso, Iso. I mean, there were lots of manufacturers who used crated American V8s in period Bristol. Um, it was just that. You fit it in the car. Um, you've got very limited adjustments. The whole thing takes care of itself. Assuming the, um, it's got uh, hydraulic tappets, hydraulic lifters, and as most of them had, uh, you don't have to adjust those, the lash on the valves. Um, the ignition timing and the, um, the idle mixtures were it. Uh, and this engine is no exception. You just take it out the crate and put it in the car. Fantastic. And it carries on doing that for some miles. And um, that's the, the great side of these engines. Uh, you've got this um, rather large uh, holly carburetor in the middle. Um, this is a... Uh, a large holly carburetor um, the LT1 engines had a 780 cubic feet a minute um, holly carburetor on them which is large for a, a small block Chevy that's a sizable carburetor you can get a shift a lot of air through there uh, 780 cubic feet a minute to be precise um, and you've got these vacuum secondaries as they're called so this is your primary choke in the carburetor here with the automatic choke flap there um, which, which closes when the engine's cold with a bimetallic spring there to suck, cause the engine to suck more fuel in because this is creating a vacuum, hence the rich mixture, hence it starts, etc., till it's warmed up and this flap gradually closes with the bimetallic spring. Been used for decades, but it works. Um, automatic choke. And then when you got to a certain point, when the throttle opened, the vacuum, this vacuum diaphragm assembly here, would open the second lot of chokes and you have a four choke, big four choke carburetor capable of feeding this, uh, this beast beyond 6,000 revs. Um, wonderfully simple. Um, these screws, uh, you've got the floats at either end here, the float chambers. These you wind in and out to adjust the height of the float chambers. Super simple, just tighten the lock nut up. And then, um, Sorry, other way around, you tighten the screw up and then adjust the lock nut, the, the height nut. Um, and then there it is. Super, super simple. On these carburettors, the idle mixture screws um, are, uh, it's that little screw there. Um, they are 
uh, unusual in that you screw them in to richen the mixture and out to weaken the mixture. And that is a counterintuitive. It's totally against what most other carburettors are like. And um, if you want to be really nerdy for a moment, the only one I can think of is the SU HIF carburettor that was used on Rover SD1s and Silver Shadow 2 Rolls Royces and things like that. You screw them in to richen them up as well. But normally, the screw's on a taper, and as you screw it out, more um, fuel can get into the air mixture. And as you screw it in, it weakens it and leans it off. Um, so, yeah, but I mean, Hollies have been like this. You know, you just, you just buy, again, you buy a carburetor, bolt it on, a couple of rudimentary adjustments, and you're good to go. Fantastically uh, pragmatic American engineering. Um, so I'm going to just uh, tune the uh, idle mixture screws on this. Um, once the ignition timing is set, um, then that's it, fit and forget. This is an electronic ignition distributor, transistorized ignition from the 1960s originally, um, which gave a good strong spark, as I have known to my cost when I actually um, grabbed the HT lead on one of them uh, some years ago. Um, and also the ignition system is shielded. Uh, the leads are actually enclosed within a, an earthing shield, like a metal cover to stop the, uh, because the Corvette was a fiberglass car, it didn't have any earth shielding around it to stop the engine causing interference, electrical interference. When somebody was watching their TV at home or something, uh, it would suddenly start crackling through the, uh, the TV speaker because there was a car outside with an unsuppressed ignition system. So what Chevrolet did was screen the whole ignition system. Um, this hasn't got it as much because it doesn't need it because it's a steel car. Um, uh, so um, yeah, the, the actual plug leads are very near the exhaust manifold, so you get some heat transfer. So actually the, the shields also acted as a heat shield as well. But anyway, we press on. Um, we'll give this, uh, I'm itching to give this car a run, see how it drives. One thing I don't need for this engine, because it's so simple, is this. Okay. We have a nasty heat shield rattle, which I will have to have a look at. I'm now going to adjust the mixture. That's one side. Now the other side. There we are. Quickest tune-up. Bit quicker than an Italian V12. Well, uh, I've been able to draw various conclusions about this car, but I have n never uh, worked on or driven an ESO Grifo up until this moment. This literally is the first drive. I'm getting, this is the beauty of these quarter lights, you get blasted with fresh air, which is great. Um, the the impressions so far, I mean, when I was tuning the engine, it became apparent, and this literally is the first time I've driven this car, it became apparent that the engine is quite highly tuned, um, and you can tell that with an American V8 because it's, or any engine for that matter, any sort of 1960s, 1970s competition uh, tuned engine, is that uh, they they are lumpy at idle and they don't idle very super smoothly at 800 rpm or whatever their manufacturers uh, suggested they idle at and the reason for that is called valve overlap and it's to do with the type of camshaft there's only one camshaft on these engines that sits in the middle of the v and uh, you have the push rods coming to the valves on either cylinder head from the middle the crotch of the v uh, the 
the valve overlap means that the to a certain extent the valve timing anticipates the next charge coming into the engine and um, that means that it gets lumpy at low revs uh, it's great at high revs when you want power but um, at lower revs it it can almost start to suffocate itself because it's trying to get the gas in and out of the combustion chamber too quickly the exhaust gases are are uh, almost pulling the inlet gas through without it actually having a chance to combust and be uh, used profitably in the combustion chamber. Very nerdy stuff. Need to do a separate video on it if people want. But um, yeah, so this is this is quite a a highly tuned engine. It's obviously got a um, a Duntoff cam in it or something similar. Uh, there was actually a cam a cam that he developed. Uh, for the Corvette engine, I think for the LT1 engine originally, to um, improve the horsepower. But of course the trade-off is that if the engine is, is cammy, is lumpy at low revs, uh, and you have to set the idle a bit higher to, uh, to get the gas working, the trade-off is that you get power higher up the rev range. And I'd be very curious um, I mean, I think 370 brake horsepower is, is credible out of a, uh, an early, early-ish, mid-1960s small block, or I think 1970 the LT1 engine came out, actually, um, Corvette. Is 370 brake horsepower credible? Uh, and I've yet to find out um, how this car actually pulls, and I am, of course, very interested in how that... Uh, how strong that is but this is uh, it's just such a thoroughbred car this um, it, that they've always been sort of uh, had this mystique about them uh, ethereal sort of uh, ESO griefos and that's witnessed by the fact that there are hardly any videos on YouTube about them um, and I've, I've, I've worked on so many cars with uh, American V8s in De Tommaso Panteras um, you name it, Jensen's, uh, even Monteverdi's, the, uh, the Swiss iteration of the V8 with the exotic styling. But I have never had anything to do in my 40 years working on these cars with ESO Grifos before. And this is a great, um, a great moment for me because I've, I, I have worked on and driven so many cars uh, over the years, but this is a novelty and I'm loving it. The, the, the view from here of these two front wings, these beautiful bulbous front wings, it's, it's sort of um, Mura-esque in a way. Uh, okay, we know we got this slab dashboard as I mentioned earlier, but the car feels lovely. Uh, the steering is not power assisted, but um, it does feel beautifully precise uh, and very obviously fingertip Control. Um, the gearbox feels like the four-speed Borg Warner gearbox that was used on um, what I suppose it would be Mako Shark C2s in this era. Um, but uh, and the exhaust makes a suitably verbally V8 noise that is very different from the likes of an AMG Mercedes. There's just no comparison. There's something about an American V8. Uh, that's just wonderful. This car is very, it's nicely damped on the road, it's sitting well. I'm not particularly pushing it, but there's, uh, there's no body roll to speak of. Um, yeah, so uh, it's warmed through, or getting there, and we can give uh, this rather sweet V8 uh, some stick and open up the taps. One of the things, the other things I've noticed about this is the high gearing. Um, this is pretty typical of four-speed gearboxes from this era. First gear is very high geared on this, like it is in a Corvette. Uh, it's not a problem, it's just noticeable, which of course means uh, in third and fourth gears you manage to be able to get that uh, high top speed without the engine doing crazy revs. Um, Whoa, me likey. 
that's just touching the throttle. Is this thing as fast as it was purported to be? There weren't that many cars in the 1960s that did over 160 miles an hour, and this was reported again. The acceleration and speed figures were um, under six seconds, 0 to 60, and 170, nudging 170 miles an hour. is properly quick this car properly quick it's straining at the leash um, when the restoration was done on it apparently they fitted aluminium uh, cylinder heads instead of the original cast iron LT1 items if I've got my facts right American engine aficionados please uh, correct me but um, they also will help with uh, with gas flow um, and hence power. Oh, this car feels nice. I think I'm falling in love. Let's get it on the straight and see what uh, see what this can do. I'm going to have to put it down to first gear because it's just so high geared. Right, here we go. Oh! Woo! Wow! The whole front end just lifts up. It's off, it's away. I'm just gonna do that again, just because I can. Get past this poor unsuspecting cyclist who's about to get a lung full of carbon monoxide. Oh! I'm running out of road. <laughs> wow. One interesting thing I've noticed about the handling is you have to apply more lock as you go around a corner. It's like the suspension loads up and then you have to input a bit more steering. But that's easily get used to a ball if such an expression exists. <laughs> oh, this is, this is addictive. Mamma mia! This is a seriously fast car. What a thing to have in the 1960s. What a car. It's roomy. Uh, I can, with my six foot frame and, and long body, I can fit in, fit in this car comfortably. Um, the trade-off for the, the, the slab-like dashboard is that everything is visible. The gauges are fall easily to, to, uh, to the eye. Um, oh, yeah. And yet you can bumble along at a thousand RPM, which is what this engine has to run at because of that high valve overlap cam. Um, this is uh, this is a lovely, lovely car. We've got to give it some some stick one more time. Whoa! The whole car rides and moves under the power of this engine. Fantastic. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. I hope you've enjoyed it and we'll be back with something else very soon.